Hello and welcome to the Ghosts and Folklore podcast. I'm Mark Royce and on each episode I investigate a different, weird and wonderful subject. And on this episode, the first episode of 2021, we are going to look at a good old-fashioned ghost story. What could be better than kicking off the year with a good old-fashioned ghost story? And this is a tale of a murdered knight. What could be more old-fashioned than that? The tale of a murdered knight. But before we get into that spine-chilling tale, I should get some of the formalities out of the way first. I mean, of course, to begin with, I'd like to wish you all a happy new year, blithin' now with that, and let's all hope it's a million times better than last year was. And secondly, I'd like to explain where this story comes from exactly, because this is a real-life ghost story. This isn't a work of fiction. This was reported as fact back in the Victorian press. Now, as regular listeners will know, I published a book a few years ago all about ghost reports in Victorian Wales. And I won't repeat myself again here, but very quickly in 30 seconds or less, just to get everyone back up to speed, I went in search of all of these long lost ghost stories from the Victorian period, which had been printed in newspapers, in magazines, in periodicals, wherever they were printed, they could have been written on the back of a beer mat, for for all I know, if if they had beer mats in the, the 19th century. I have no idea. But if these stories were recorded in some way during the Victorian period and I could get my hands on them, I included them in this book. And I've included several of these tales on previous episodes of this podcast. In fact, the very first episode ever, number one, The Two-Headed Phantom of Abbasachan, is another tale taken from this book. So if you do enjoy this tale, and I'm sure you will, but if you do enjoy this tale of The Murdered Knight, and you would like more Welsh ghost stories from the Victorian period, then please go back and check out the very first episode, or even better, pop to your local bookshop and pick up a copy of Ghosts of Wales. But anyway, that's enough build-up, enough waffle from me. Let's get in to the terrifying accounts which took place back in 1897. This tale, this creepy tale as they refer to it, was published in a newspaper called The Weekly Mail back in 1897. Right at the end of the 19th century, and the story was related to the reporter by, and I'm going to quote, an intelligent official of a Glamorganshire school board. So this person who claimed to have seen, well, I don't I don't want to spoil the story for you, but let's just say they claim to have seen something quite unusual. This person was an intelligent person, and they were an official on the school board. And this this crops up quite often in these old accounts. Well, it still crops up in modern-day accounts, but it's important to differentiate between the intelligent people who claim to have seen ghostly things and the other kind of people who the newspapers like to frame in a way that their evidence isn't as valid. So this might be drunken people. If a drunken person sees a ghost, it can't be real. If a inverted commas mad person sees a ghost, it can't be real. But if an inverted commas again intelligent person sees a ghost, well, we need to take this a little bit more seriously or so the newspapers would have us believe. Now, our story starts in Breckenshire, the historic county, the county of Brecon. And the man, this intelligent man, was walking the Breckenshire countryside for the benefit of his health and change. So maybe the doctor told him to go and uh, take in the fresh air in the lovely Brecon beacons, which is is good for your health, good for your soul. And I, I, I don't know, I'm kind of... I'm making up a story for this man now, which wasn't printed, but he was walking there and it just so happened he had a relation 
who was working in a nearby secluded farmhouse. And I think we can already see where this is going. A secluded farmhouse. It just screams ghost story at you, doesn't it? But this intelligent man decides to pay a visit. Possibly because, along with being intelligent, he was somebody who was not predisposed to believing in the paranormal but that description is followed by an important word a key word he was not predisposed to believing in the paranormal beforehand yes beforehand before he went to the secluded farmhouse he did not believe in the paranormal afterwards well we'll find out soon and what I'll do throughout this story, because there is some lovely, lovely language used and descriptive passages that I will quote directly throughout. And I'm sure you, you will pick up when it's it's my voice and it's the voice of this, this Victorian wanderer who was a shrewd, common sense man. Now, while on a tramp, about halfway between Bracken and Bilf, he came to an old fashioned farm and it had dormer windows gables with a large walled garden and an amplitude of ivy good old ivy you need ivy for, for for the perfect gothic ghost story and we are getting the lot bring on the ivy the more ivy the better but we are told that it was a house which had seen better days a palace it was not and it was occupied by a farmer and his wife and one maid servant who lived a quiet, uneventful life. Now, this maid servant is the relation we were talking about. So this is the person that the school official, the intelligent school official, was going to visit. And upon doing so, he was welcomed in. He was welcomed in for tea and even asked to sleep there. Now, of course, this is the Victorian times where sleeping in a stranger's house, well, not, not entirely, he, he knew the servant, but the, the house was new to him. But, I mean, in the 19th century, you, you couldn't just call for a taxi to pick you up at the end of the day. Certainly not if he was traipsing out in, in, in the wilds of Wales. So this was a perfectly natural thing to, to invite him to spend the night. And if only he had known then what lay in store? Well, well, again, I'm getting ahead of myself slightly. So let's get back to the story. And so this man retires to bed. And now the tension is building very nicely indeed in this story. I think we can sense that there is something looming on the horizon. And what I'd like to do is to quote directly from the newspaper for the next part, because the, the, the newspaper sums it up so perfectly, there's no need for me to spoil it. And so, as mentioned, he retired to bed, and in the middle of the night, woke up as sharply as if it had been daybreak, with an uncomfortable feeling of chilliness, and an impression that there was someone in the room. He remained perfectly quiet and, in a second or two, was aware of a faint, luminous appearance and saw a filmy outline of a figure in armour. He could see no head, but the armour was very distinct. He spoke in a quiet, soothing voice, saying, Whoever you are, make yourself visible to me and speak. I am not afraid. And a slightly increased force of vision resulted, as if the form was endeavouring to fulfil his wish. But gradually, the luminosity disappeared and he fell asleep. Now, as mentioned, some of these descriptions are wonderful, and there is a heck of a lot to unpick from that one one paragraph alone. But basically, he, he woke up as if it was morning. Something had disturbed his slumber in the way the sunlight coming through the windows might do, or a cockerel making a, a heck of a noise outside of his window. But he was awake, bolt upright, and then... He felt what, what he described as an uncomfortable feeling of chilliness. Now, of course, 
this is something which will be familiar to to, to modern day ghost hunters. This, this chilliness, some people believe, is an indication of a ghostly presence. There, other people say it's not. That's that's a story for an, another day, an argument for another day. But certainly in this case, there was an icy chilliness and the impression that there was somebody else in the room. Again, a popular motif of ghost stories, that feeling that something was there. You you, you can't put your finger on it. You don't know what, but you are not alone. And, And of course, in this case, he then saw something as well. This faint, luminous appearance of of something in armour, but minus the head. Now, this is just me thinking aloud, but if we can see the armour but there is no head, no helmet. Maybe this was a knight with its helmet off, and all we can see is the the clothing. I mean, in this case, the clothing is heavy metal armour, but we can't see any of the... What, what, what would have been the flesh, I guess, the, the, the human that would have been inside. So maybe what we are seeing is a knight with its helmet off, and the head, the human part, is not for whatever reason, materialising. And and I I don't know, I'm just... It's just an idea off the top of my head that I'm putting out there. But we could not see the knight himself. And I I am assuming it was a him at the time. But we could not see the knight, certainly, where the face would be, the only visible piece of of flesh, I guess, the, the human bit that would be visible. And then, quite uniquely for this story, I do, I love this little touch, but when he asks this ghost, if indeed a ghost it is, to make itself visible to me, well, by all accounts, it does try. I mean, but back to his, his description again, the slightly increased force of vision resulted. So I, I imagine it's like a ghost really straining like almost like a weightlifter trying to pick up something really really heavy and straining and straining and we just get this little extra blip of of paranormal activity but then like that it's gone the luminosity disappears altogether so so maybe again this is just me thinking off the top of my head maybe they have a limited amount of 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 power for want of a better word and maybe if they are on low power they can hang around for hours but if they go to full power to try and show themselves then bang that they're gone and that's the end of it maybe it's like with Mobile phones nowadays, where you have the option to have power saving mode, and that'll keep your phone going for a week. But if you go on to full on, let's get GPS and Bluetooth and all the apps running, then your power runs out in half an hour. Maybe ghosts work in the same way. Maybe, maybe I'm talking rubbish. I don't know, but that's I'm putting that out there. If you think it's rubbish, feel free to, to let me know on on the usual channels. But after all of that excitement, this man falls asleep i don't think i don't think if i'd been in that situation i'd be falling asleep afterwards i'm sure most people would get up and have a cup of coffee at this point but there you go he falls asleep and in the morning he sees his relative the maid servant who is described as and again i'll quote an unsophisticated girl as innocent as the day but nevertheless she was cheerful so this cheerful yet unsophisticated girl, asked her relative the next day, how did you sleep? A perfectly innocent, normal question to ask anyone staying in your house the next day, how did you sleep? Well, her relation did not just blurt out, well, as it turns out, I saw a ghostly knight clanking around my bedroom, but instead, he was a little bit more evasive and the reason for that is because he wanted to to test his niece to test the servant girl to see if she knew of anything strange happening in that room without him giving away that he had encountered it himself as mentioned she is a a naive or an innocent girl i think the the exact words were so he was sure that she would tell the truth and if there had been any other encounters she would let slip. So, he said, and I quote, It was a capital bed, girl. Very comfortable indeed. And she replied with, And you were not disturbed, uncle? To which he said, 
In what way do you mean? Maybe, maybe we're getting towards something here. And she says, well, they do say the room is haunted. And one or two who have slept there have seen a figure wearing tin things on or something like dish covers, which is a wonderful, wonderful Welsh description of a knight in shining armour, wearing tin things or something like dish covers. Now, of course, the man was trying to test out his niece. It had worked. This satisfied him, we are told. And without revealing anything himself, he had been gifted this information that the room was haunted. Now, we could ask if this innocent girl knew this the night before maybe it would have been polite to mention it beforehand or or maybe she didn't want to unnecessarily worry her uncle i don't know anyway she knew the room was haunted she did not tell him beforehand he spent the night there and had that experience and having begun our story as somebody who was not predisposed to believing in the paranormal he was now planning a return visit. The experience had, while he he wouldn't say that yes, he believed in ghosts as such, he certainly was open to the idea now, and he planned to return to that secluded farmhouse for another quiet visit and further investigation. He had become a ghost hunter himself in the space of one night. And to quote him, when asked about his, his, his beliefs, his opinions, his, his fears maybe of seeing this, he said, I am not afraid. It cannot hurt me, and I am satisfied that there is something in it. And he might well have had a point, because we are told in this story that the tradition in the locality, in and around Brecon, the Brecon Beacons, Brecon Shire, is that a knight was murdered by another. That, that's a quote. A knight was murdered by another. And now this, this, this vision that appears to people as they sleep in the guest room in this farmhouse would presumably be the murdered knight. And as we near the end of this tale, I should give you the disclaimer that I include with all of these Victorian ghost stories. And that is, they can be wonderful stories on the one hand, and incredibly frustrating on the other. This one, again, is a case in point, because it's a wonderful tale of a murdered knight, and an encounter by a man we are led to believe who would not make up such things. And yet... We have no further information because that is where the trail goes cold. We do not know if he did go back. Maybe he went back several times. We do not know if he had further encounters with the knight. We do not know, well, anything else. That that is is the end. And of course, if this was a work of fiction, I could wrap things up nicely and make something up like, yes, he, he went back there and had a good old chat with that knight, but I can't. It, it, is, it is a real story. It is reported as fact, and all I can do is give you the details as I found them, and that is the tale of the murdered knight. Now, as mentioned at the start of this episode, this is the first episode of 2021, I thought it would be lovely to start with a good old-fashioned ghost story, but I am also in the process of thinking up some some quirky new ideas for this year, and I would love to know what you would like to hear over the coming months, well, over the coming 12 months, I guess, what you would like to hear on this podcast this year. Do you want more ghost stories, more Victorian ghost stories, maybe more modern-day ghost stories, and what about the folklore which we haven't really touched upon in this episode. Do you want tales of wizards and witches and devils? What about the Mabinogion? What about cursed objects? What about the Mary... Well, actually, no, we we won't go back to the Mary Lloyd quite yet. Let's leave the Mary Lloyd have some some time off after her 
Christmas festive shenanigans, but we will certainly be checking back in with the Mary Lloyd at some point later this year. But as always, it would be lovely to know what you think of not just this episode, but what kind of things you'd like to hear in the future. And it's quite easy to track me down if you go onto social media, do a search for Mark Rees and put the word ghosts or whales or folklore in. I will pop up on top on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram. And of course, you can just do the same search using a search engine and you will find my, my website and my books and all the other nonsense I've, I've got out there on the internet. And of course, very quickly, but as always, if you are online and you are looking for me, please consider hitting subscribe on this podcast. It will take you seconds. It costs nothing, but it makes me very happy to know that people are listening and enjoying and they want to hear more. So maybe that could be your New Year's resolution this year. If you don't already, make a promise to yourself that in 2021, this will be the year that you lose all of that weight, you land that dream job, you get millions in the lottery and buy a Mercedes and a house in Miami, and you subscribe to this podcast. And I'd like to wrap up this episode with a very quick little bit of Welsh folklore about January, which will help you predict the weather in future. And before I leave you with that fascinating little bit of folklore, it just leaves me to say that I've been Mark Rees. This has been my Ghosts and Folklore podcast beaming to you from Wales to the world. And to misquote Peter Venkman, it is the best, it's the beautiful, it is the only Ghosts and Folklore podcast. And on that note, you might be interested to know that if we have a mild and sunny January... Look out your window right now. Is it looking mild and sunny? If so, that promises a cold spring and an uncertain summer. Now, obviously, I don't know what the weather is like right now as I record this, but something tells me if I look out of my window right now in Wales, it's probably a little bit grey and rainy, which means a warm spring and a certain summer, which I think is a little bit of good news to start the year and gives us something to look forward to. Until next time, thank you for listening. Diolch and Varian, I'm Grando. No star.